achieve its master plan in case a pandemic of bird flu hits. To save Terry's life, uh, we're going to be appealing. Senate bill on stem cell research that's coming up. Six hospitals are so busy, they're diverting patients away. There are no easy answers. What we do at the Berman Institute is uh, provide the reflective, analytic, careful examination of these tough questions. Andrew Lane? If you listen to people's stories, if you listen to stories for very long, you start to understand that their lives are so much more complex than the medicine. And you guys, you have a complicated household already. But then if you scratch that surface just a little bit, you understand that the medicine is probably the simplest part of this sometimes. A young girl was admitted to the Children's Center, and it was becoming increasingly clear that this might very well be an HIV-related pneumonia. The problem was this girl didn't have a diagnosis of HIV. She had been healthy. Her mother was HIV positive, and she didn't want her daughter to know. And it was very painful for the residents to try and figure out how to work both with the daughter and keep her fears under control while not trying to go against the mother's wishes. Being good at ethics is part of being good at medicine. That's the kind of teaching that we're able to do. Teaching clinical ethics through the Berman Institute is enormous, not just for the immediate patients that these doctors and nurses will touch, but everyone that they will train, and that's everywhere in the world. Many people are chronically ill before the end of life. I've decided now I don't want to do, I don't ever want to go on a ventilator. So that's a tremendous challenge for us in providing better quality of end of life care. We're studying how family members are engaged in decision making with the patient who has a terminal illness. The biggest surprise is how many family members use the term we. For example, a terminally ill patient and his spouse, they are so close that they don't see decision-making as independent. They almost see themselves as one unit. And so that has tremendous implications for health professionals. It means we need to engage this family unit as if it were one person. This community is right in the triangle of Johns Hopkins, and we're dealing with all these environmental and health-related issues. We have some of the highest respiratory problems and other health problems than the whole state of Maryland. It is a sad truth that a medical school and school of public health that are arguably among the best in the world are still surrounded by people who have tremendous needs for better health conditions. Research often provides services that unfortunately are not otherwise available. Environmental justice means that research needs the community to have its own voice in how research is planned, could affect the rate of asthma, how research is conducted, and in how the results of research are given back to communities so that ultimately their health can be improved. We are at the forefront in international health and public health, and in medical care. Biomedical science is exploding in cell biology, in neuroscience, and in genetics. Here we were working on fetal and embryonic tissues. Questions were being raised. What does this fetal tissue represent, or this embryonic tissue represent? And to me, we don't have biologic answers for those. These are philosophical answers. If we can, for example, in the laboratory, generate eggs and sperm, well, what would that mean? What would that mean for human reproduction? What would that mean for parenthood? There are no easy answers to these questions, but the Berman Institute is right there with our colleagues, and together we shape what the issues are that we should be addressing in the next 10 years. What's the next breakthrough in the lab going to be? What's the next emerging infection likely to be? When you look at the prevalence and incidence rates of TB here in Baltimore, I think they are almost non-significant. Uh, 
and therefore it's hard for them to imagine how big a problem it is back in Zambia, in my country, or in Africa in general. Whether we're talking about infectious diseases that know no borders, or we're talking about biomedical research, which also knows no borders. So when we think at the Berman Institute, we do think globally. And when we train, we train for everywhere. And the African Fogarty program is for us just extremely special. At some point in our lives, each of us is gonna be a patient and inevitably we're going to be asked to give informed consent. We're going to be sick. We're going to be potentially vulnerable. We're going to be confused by all the options in front of us. And when we're asked to give informed consent, we're going to want that consent process to be genuine. What is a consent? What does it mean to be informed? How do we understand when something is voluntary? Can a dying patient ever freely consent to anything? There's an old maxim that says good ethics demands good facts. One of the things the Berman Institute is known for is doing what's called empirical research in bioethics. What that means is we add facts to people's rhetoric. We use the tools of the social sciences such as sociology, epidemiology, anthropology, and try and figure out how we can best protect the rights and interests of people, whether they're patients or potential research participants. Much of the history of informed consent came out of a series of bad stories, cases where either doctors or researchers did things to people without their permission or consent. The Tuskegee syphilis experiment, you'll see they died as a direct result of syphilis. They were told that they were getting an effective medication and it wasn't. They've infected their spouses, some of their children are born with the disease. It's not only affected that small population, but it's affected black culture. The minor in bioethics will definitely make me a better member of the public health community. I really want to be someone who thinks differently because often that's where the solution comes from. You know your own heart and you know what you value. Our undergraduates that don't go on to become doctors and don't go on to become scientists will go on to become ill and they will definitely go into that polling booth and vote on assisted suicide, universal access to health care or stem cell research. As far as myself is concerned and my peers, as they come through the Johns Hopkins University and go out into the world, in the back of their minds, there'll still be some sense of bioethics that really allows them to think outside of the box. To think through these tough questions, you couldn't have designed Johns Hopkins more appropriately.